things. All right, so let's pick these apart. <coughs> yeah. Can I just ask um, yeah, of course. It's <coughs> just regards to just out of interest. Now we switch over from terrestrial to digital. Yeah. What is the difference between a digital wave and a normal wave? Well, the, 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 the difference is more fundamental than that in the sense that, as, as the show implies, you're no longer trying to measure uh, amplitudes and frequencies. You're just trying to measure on or off. Right, so it really is a naught and one transmission, which is why it's not so subject to interference and all that sort of stuff. Right, you're really only trying to detect is the signal on or is the signal off. Right, so and then the then your TV image. set decodes that into uh, a visual image again. Yeah. Um, so radio waves. <coughs> Let's start at the long wave end of the spectrum. Um, Really very easy. Um, in its basics, as I say, it's just you know one aerial producing an EM wave picked up by uh, another aerial. It's just one current inducing another current at a distance. Um, and I'll come back to this in a second. But um, you know wavelengths, you know greater than say about 30 centimeters. So frequencies less than about a gigahertz. Um, and we really are only talking about moving electrons in a bit of wire right, to produce these EM waves um, and then picking them up by reversing that process essentially uh, in another piece of wire which is our, our aerial. Um, now for FM radio which is what most of you will be using it's, it's somewhat <coughs> Diff somewhat different. Um, this this actually is is an old AM amplitude modulation style, right? but it, it displays the same sort of stuff, uh, and it's relying on the principle of superposition. This is just a bit of technology on the side, right? So we've got a carrier wave, this thing here. So one constant frequency. So where you tune into a radio station, right? So. Uh, I don't know, what am I going to pick? Um, radio 4, right? 104 megahertz roughly, depending on where you are. Sorry, had to be radio 4. Um, that's, we're talking about the carrier signal frequency. That is at 104 megahertz. All right, but you're listening to speech, okay? And speech is going to be, um, you know, what it's going to be, a few kilohertz. At the most, yeah, or even music, right? We're up to 17 kilohertz. No one's going to bother broadcasting anything higher than that because we couldn't hear. Um, so here's our audio signal, and all we do is superpose the two. We add one to the other, right? And that's essentially what happens in this circuit here. We allow the two to overlap. So what you broadcast is your carrier signal, which has been somewhat modified now by being superposed with this audio signal at the other end. Right? And that goes into our aerial now. That's our alternating current, our oscillating current that Faraday talked about going into a wire. It's going to cause the electrons in these wires to oscillate with those frequencies. Right? and with an amplitude that depends on the amplitude of this signal. So an EM wave comes out generated by that. Okay, and it's picked up now by another aerial where we get oscillating electrons again, right? which are picking up on this signal. So this is then replicated with what comes out of the aerial at the other end. And all that we do in here is go through the superposition process again. But we flip this upside down. So where there was a peak here, we get a trough here. That's essentially all that's happening. So if you add those together, it's the same thing as taking away the original carrier frequency. Right? That is, that's what happens when you're tuning in your radio receiver. You're varying the frequency of the signal to subtract from what's coming in at your area. So all that's left when it comes out the other side is just the audio bit again. 
So it's just the principle of superposition being applied twice in this process, basically. Yeah? Um, so, this is how it works. It's really, really simple. Anyone ever built their own FM aerial? Ah, oh, you should do. Honestly, it's so easy. I, I've done this twice now since I moved here because there are a couple of stations that I like to listen to and around this part of Kent the signal is atrocious. I won't tell you which because you'll probably giggle. But given that there was a bit of giggling over Radio 4, I certainly won't tell you about the other stations I listen to. All right, so I built my own aerial, right, to maximise the signal, because the standard aerial that comes with a uh, with a tuner is really, you know, it's generic. It's there to be reasonably okay at all the basic FM frequencies. So everything from, you know, what is it, 93, 94 megahertz up to about 115, right, is the standard FM variation, something like that, right? Might go a bit, does it go low? Radio 2 is Is it really? Yeah. Radio 2. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, my wife likes it, I have to say. It, it's, so now it's a girl's thing. It's, it's not <laughs> my, um, it's not my thing, right? Um, well, actually, all you need to do, as the diagram suggests, to optimise your aerial, is to go for half a wavelength. Right? And you can work that out. So pick whatever your radio station is that you're having trouble picking up or that you want to pick up particularly well. You know it's carrier frequency. Right? That's part of the station's identity is its carrier frequency. So now you can work out what its wavelength is. This is just the speed of light, remember. Yeah? So now all you need to do is to build an aerial that is half a wavelength. Okay? And, you know, I, literally, the one that is in my attic is two nails with a bit of copper wire between them of the right length. Right? It is that complicated. Uh, it took me an hour to do this. And most of that was finding a bit of copper wire. Um, so, um, the basic design is literally that single piece of copper wire all you've got to do is make sure that the nails are put in the rafters another right distance apart actually there's a wrinkle here right? if you're an electronics engineer you know that there are some really weird end effects associated with this. So actually, you'd use 95% of it, but you know that, that's, that's engineering, not physics. All right. But if you really want to build, you know, a true geeks aerial, then that is the formula to use. So this just connects to your aero cable, so standard coax cable. All right. So the core connects to one side, uh, and whatever the shielding braid is connects to the other. Right, and then down through a coax plug into the back of your radio tuner. Dead easy. So, you know, pick what you want and build it in that way. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a wrinkle to this, a slight wrinkle, in the sense that the orientation of this aerial now becomes quite sensitive. So it's not like the bog standard aerial you'll have built into the equipment in your house. Uh, this is highly directional. So if you really want the very best signal, you're going to need to sort of, you know, rotate it around a bit until you find uh, uh, the, the biggest signal strength. Okay? But it works really, really well. So there we are. Complete digression from the syllabus, but probably one of the more useful things I might have taught you this morning. Um, and proof positive that I am definitely uh, a geek. Um, actually, what's the thing else I can show you this one? I'll do it later. Um, so anyway, moving on to microwaves. <coughs> um, and I'll come back to microwaves in a practical sense maybe later on. Um, in terms of how microwave ovens work and so on, you might as well know that sort of stuff. Again, not on the syllabus, but quite useful. Um, particularly since I can tell you why it is you don't do certain things with microwave ovens 
if you want them to stay in one piece. Um, so we're going, we're changing wavelength now, we're going down in wavelength a little bit, uh, and uh, we're therefore going up in frequency. Alright, so microwaves are going to be well into the gigahertz region. All right, so most of your microwave ovens will be in the sort of you know, 10 to 15 gigahertz region. Uh, the radar speed traps we talked about are in this gigahertz region as well, are generally microwave type frequencies. Um, now we've got to a point now where we can't easily use electrons moving up and down in wires for the simple reason our electrons won't move that fast. So there's something slightly different that we use now. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but they are um, really rather <coughs> specialised uh, valves, essentially. Klystrons and magnetron valves. So, you know, these were developed when the first radar systems were developed, for instance. So they come out of that initial technology. Um, and we can guide microwaves around just as we guide light through fibre optic cables. So again, your microwave ovens actually use metal tubes to take the microwaves from the source into the resonance cavity, which is where your food is set. So we can pipe microwaves around, essentially, uh, which is quite useful. Uh, putting a few of these things together in terms of communications, this is a really silly, silly cartoon. I mean, look at the mobile phone, bottom left. Um, but, you know, it just shows you the breadth of frequencies that we use uh, um, now, for instance, from uh, microwaves, which we'd use for satellite communications, for instance, TV signals, these um, ultra-high frequency signals, radio in VHF, um, and, uh, you know, ground-to-ship communications, that sort of thing, will typically be at lower frequencies. Um, so they'll use actually the ionosphere, the charged particles in the atmosphere as a reflector um, of electromagnetic waves so that they can actually bounce essentially around the earth and get longer distances. Um, and then you get the really low frequency stuff that goes through the ground. Alright, so if you want to communicate with a submarine for instance, you have to use uh, ultra low frequency. EM waves. Right. Anyone been through rugby on the East Coast main line? Just before you get to rugby there is a field with a sort of L shape of aerials, right, which nobody is supposed to know about, it's not publicised, but actually it's an ultra low frequency communication centre. So these aerials actually cover a huge field because basically they need to produce very long wave low frequency uh, EM waves and it's used for submarine communications right. um, so you know again quite a broad range but anyway let's pick, pick up the pace a little bit we're into infrared now uh, well you know how to detect infrared crudely right. the heat sensitive cells on the back of your hand are actually quite good at doing that Right, so you know that's that's straightforward. Um, but if you want to do it more sensitively, you can actually just use a thermocouple. Right, you remember this diagram from last term when we were doing temperature measurement devices. Uh, and all we need to do really is to make a small adaptation to one of the junctions. So we've still got our reference junction here in melting ice. But all you do up here to turn this into what um, um, you know infrared astronomers, for instance, would refer to as a barometer or a thermopile or whatever word it is they've chosen, um, is to take our very small junction here and flatten it out, you know, to produce some sensible surface area. Uh, and um, you know, if you're really sensible, you either coat it or make it out of uh, metals that have a fairly dark thermal energy absorbing colour. Right? And it will just pick up then, it will detect the energy in the infrared radiation. 
So if you're doing infrared ast uh, astronomy, that's essentially the method you use. Right? And remember, these junctions can be made out of absolutely tiny bits of metal. It is just the junction between two dissimilar metals. It doesn't have to be big bits of metal. It can be really fine uh, wires that you're using. So in other words, it doesn't take much energy to change its temperature a little bit, which you can then measure as a voltage. So this is a way of actually quantitatively measuring um, infrared. And you can see that right, the wavelength has changed now. We're down to uh, uh, millimeters, down to, you know, um, well, a few hundred nanometers at least. Uh, and the frequencies have correspondingly gone up. So we're actually into the terahertz region now. We've gone out of the gigahertz. We've added another order of uh, three orders of magnitude. Um, so we're into visible light. So our classic wavelength range for visible light. We know where this comes from. We know how it's detected. We did all that last time. All right, so there's no point in sort of expanding on that uh, a great deal. Um, and you know, measuring it, picking it up is not terribly difficult. We know about you know, how we do it in our retinas. Um, but obviously we also know that we can pick it up using photocells. So we can use semiconductors to pick it up. We can actually make electricity that way, but, you know, we can also measure light intensity that way. Um, ultraviolet, similarly, we're going out the same way. Uh, and again, we talked about where, where this came from. It is just transitions between energy levels again. We're just not talking about the outermost electrons now. We're talking about electrons that are a little bit deeper in, a little bit more tightly held uh, by the nucleus, so the energy scales go up uh, a bit. Um, um, you know, we detect it in again, you know, different uh, uh, different sort of ways. So again, we can use um, semiconductors. So we can use the fact that the ultraviolet will excite electrons in a material. And we can use that, for instance, to generate a current and detect it. <coughs> X-rays, again, we talked about this last term. It is just transitions between energy levels again. But now we're talking about, remember, the innermost electrons, the most tightly bound to the nucleus. So the energy levels have gone way up. And we're talking about kilovolts, tens of kilovolts now for an X-ray. But it's, it's still an electromagnetic wave. It's still doing all the same stuff that all the other things we've talked about so far have done. Uh, it's just coming from uh, a somewhat different place. Same thing with gamma rays. We're still talking about excitations, but now between energy levels inside the nucleus, rather than energy levels associated with electrons. So we're not talking about tens of kilovolts now. We're talking about megavolts, huge energy associated with gamma rays uh, and correspondingly therefore you know amazing uh, amazingly high um, frequencies and very low length scales you'll see there's a correspondence all right in length scales here um, yeah, stop there there's a correspondence in length scales when we were talking about radio waves we were talking about the wholesale movement of electrons in a piece of wire yeah. So does that mean radio astronomy is literally being the currents being induced by the electric field of the star or whatever you're observing? Um, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, because it is. I mean, you're picking up variations in a, uh, an electromagnetic field, which will have come from the movement of charged particles somewhere. Um, mm. If we're talking about radio waves, certainly. If we're doing X-ray astronomy, then it's X-rays coming in, which will be associated with transitions between energy levels and so on, yeah. uh, in one form or another. All right. Um, I mean, there, there are there are the, there's, there's subtleties to this, right? In the sense that uh, how can I describe this? Um, I mean, we're still talking about charged particles, all right, all the time. So it's the movement of a charge. It doesn't have to be an electron. It could be a positively charged thing. Mm. Um, so if, for instance, if you go to a modern research X-ray source, it'll be based 
uh, not on you know bombarding atoms and getting the innermost electrons to go through transitions but it'll be based on taking electrons and accelerating them in a ring right so it's the same sort of process you're making the electrons go through transitions in energy levels and in fact the way that's done in a synchrotron source for instance to get the, the sort of peak uh, um, intensity x-rays is that you take them around I mean you're, you're taking them around very very high energy so we're talking about you know very close to the speed of light and then you put them through magnetic fields so you make them wiggle right as they go around the end of the orbit so they're still basically they're going around in a circle but there are bits where they're made to wiggle in a magnetic field now that is essentially the same thing as saying you're making them go through um, angular acceleration yeah and maybe rephrase my question slightly. Yeah, if we had a sensitive enough instrument, would we be able to detect a magnetic field from a star we can see in the night sky by the simple, by the virtue of the fact that we can see it? Uh, probably not. But if the magnetic field and electric field are both carried by EM waves, why? Yeah, but they're generated by the movement of charged particles, right? So it's, it's the electric field that is the driver in this. The magnetic field is a, is, a, is a parasite, if you like. It's, well, no, that's right. It, it's created because there is a variation in the electric field. Right. Right? So, you know, Jupiter has a very intense magnetic field, for instance, as does the Earth. But you can't measure it with a magnetometer or anything at a distance. Because the thing that propagates out is the electromagnetic wave, not it's not the magnetism that's causing it it's the movement of the charged particles that is causing it charged particles moving is a current right. it's, a, it's, it's a difficult philosophical issue I know so it, it's probably worth going to the textbook and yeah. reading it through slowly you know with a, with a damp towel on your head or whatever it takes uh, but I'm happy to come